Um, welcome everybody to the first edition of the AGI webinar. Very briefly, just a very short introduction for uh, those uh, who don't know much about the association. We are a 20 years old association of young scholars and uh, students working on South Asia and more particularly on uh, India. So generally the AGI organizes two main events, events every year. Uh, an international workshop in India and a seminar in France. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we are not able to organize these events uh, because of the situation. So um, we are happy to propose you this uh, webinar. And uh, today is a special day because it's the first uh, webinar of the series, but uh, also because uh, Kalik Parker, who is the presenter, uh, is also the new president of the AGI. In fact, we have elected the new board members a couple of weeks ago. And so um, we are happy to present you Kalik Parker, who is the president, and Victor, who is the secretary of AGI. If you want to join us, please uh, renew your membership on the website. We have a lot of new events uh, in our uh, head to to think about and to propose you and uh, I hope uh, new people will uh, join us to work together. So I let Ismari introduce the webinar. Yeah, um, so the webinar uh, started from the idea that um, uh, we uh, at the association, uh, we had a, we, we've had a social problem to hire new members and uh, in the academic world, uh, uh, increasingly, uh, people are going towards thematic issues, uh, to research on thematic issues rather than uh, aerial issues. And uh, we at the AGI are an association which has been created uh, over the idea that India uh, and South Asia had, had specificities that deserved uh, specific, particular expert attention. So this webinar will try to address several issues to try and understand whether those issues are specific to India. Can we understand them in a broader context? Can we understand them uh, through a thematic approach that rather than aerial approaches? So uh, the first one will be uh, on smart cities, which is today with uh, Kalik who will present the issues of uh, the India's uh, smart cities missions. And the question, um, I mean, he will, he will have uh, his own uh, uh, questions, but I had asked him to uh, basically question whether the smart cities in project and uh, uh, plan in India was uh, particular to uh, the, the, the country, to this area, or would we find uh, um, um, uh, would we find uh, features which are common to other countries? Because as we know, uh, there are smart cities all across the world, in China, from China to the Middle East. Um, the second session uh, will be on February 2nd with the member of uh, Franco-Indian Research Collective, uh, including, for example, Arnaud Cabar, uh, Rémi de Bersegol, who will come and introduce us uh, with their new project on uh, COVID in India. Uh, the impact of COVID, uh, of COVID in India. The second uh, uh, seminar on March 2nd will be with uh, a GIA specialist uh, because we mostly have researchers uh, who will come in this seminar who are actually using qualitative methods of investigation. Uh, on March 2nd, we will have GIA specialist Alexandre Sebeyak who will talk about the specificity of Indian data uh, and try to explain how complex it is uh, to work uh, with Indian data and what is particular about them. So it will be particularly interesting uh, since uh, uh, soon will be released the uh, last, uh, the latest uh, Indian census. On April 6, we will have a debate uh, with the representative of different aerial associations, the Association uh, of uh, Southeast Asian Studies, the G the, 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 the GIS, uh, GIS Asia. So GIS Asia is a, the network of researchers working on Asia. And of course, the AGI will debate around the thematic of their association 
uh, is it still relevant to work uh, on an area, to have uh, an area of specialization, or is it difficult today to uh, manage an association uh, which is based on a specific uh, regional area? On May 4th, uh, we'll have Florian, which is, uh, who is here today. We'll talk about a very classic subjects uh, in Indian studies, uh, that is social stratification. And she will draw on her extensive uh, work in Palampur to, uh, to discuss the question of upward mobility in India. Uh, can we use uh, the tools of the social sciences to understand social stratification in India? Will be one of the questions she will address. And eventually, last uh, webinar on June 7th, so maybe we, hope, we are hoping we can do a physical event, uh, maybe in Paris, uh, we'll discuss that, uh, but maybe it will be partly physical, partly online, uh, with uh, Roland Lardinois, who, is, uh, uh, who has extensively worked on uh, Indian studies uh, since uh, a few decades. And uh, he will come and discuss about his experience uh, related to uh, Indian studies and also his research on Indian studies on the structuration of the field of this academic field of research. And maybe he will sketch some uh, perspective, perspectives for the field. Uh, so I will uh, not uh, talk more and I will leave the floor to Kalik, who will uh, start uh, presenting uh, his paper on the digital geography of uh, India's smart cities mission. So Kalik, you have the flow. Uh, try to uh, uh, keep it to uh, 30 minutes. And then later on, we will have a Q&A &A question and we will stop this webinar at uh, uh, 2 p.m. sharp. Okay, Kalik, you can, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Eve Marie. Uh, I'll just start in a minute. Um, Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm going to be presenting on the digital geography of India's smart cities mission. Um, okay, just an outline of my presentation today. Uh, I will begin by introducing the smart cities mission since many of you may not be familiar with it. Uh, I will locate it uh, in relation to my doctoral research, what I am trying to do. Um, I will introduce a methodological approach uh, known as digital geographies, considering I'm going to be using that for today's presentation. Um, I'm going to elaborate on the digital layers of the smart cities mission. So I'm going to look at policies, institutions, uh, technocracy, and stakeholders. This is in particular relation to uh, the digital turn. Uh, I will identify what this is known as datafication or the algorithmic turn in urban governance. I will raise other key concerns and then I will end with a conception of data justice. Uh, so just a quick introduction to India's smart cities mission. I am not going into the history of India's urban governance. Um, so India's smart cities mission was a program that was established in 2015 aimed at urban renewal and retrofitting for 100 plus cities. It famously refused to define what a smart city is. Instead, what it does is it imagines that people using technology uh, with new governance structures um, are going to create smart solutions, are going to uh, use information and communication tools, especially mobile-based tools, in order to create their own vision of what is a smart city. Uh, now, from the larger uh, smart cities mission, uh, there are five key themes that I want to talk about. One is the creation of new governance structures. For instance, it creates what is known as a special purpose vehicle. Um, second, it aims at enhancing citizens' participation. Third, there is an increased digitization process through tools and data. Fourth is it creates a new financing system for cities. Uh, and fifth, it in, even though historically we have had private stakeholders in urban governance, uh, the Smart Cities Mission enhances this even more. Now for me and uh, for my PhD work, I'm largely increased in the themes that are highlighted in blue, which is enhancing citizens' participation, uh, the increased digitization process, and the role that private firms play uh, in providing technological support to the government. Um, I'm going to elaborate on each of these as I go along. Um, to give you a context to uh, my work, so I'm interested in looking at how citizens participate in the context of a digital democracy. Uh, and for me, uh, how is democratic participation 
imagined by the Smart Cities Mission as a new program and a policy? How do citizens themselves participate through civic technologies? Uh, but more importantly, I'm also interested at this stage looking at how are these technologies co-created? How are the policies created, institutions established? How does the technocracy work? How do firms, citizens, and other institutions and stakeholders engage with each other? Uh, largely, I'm interested in the question of can, can technology truly improve the quality of citizenship? Now, there are two broad um, ways in which I operationalize this research. One is looking at, the, at this larger layer, uh, which understands what is digital policy, uh, what are the institutions that the digital policy creates, uh, and who are these new stakeholders that play an important role. The other is looking at actual on-ground participation. Um, at this stage, I am not going to be focusing on uh, on-ground participation. Uh, for this presentation, I'm focusing largely on digital policy, institutions, stakeholders, uh, and as I go along. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so methodologically, what do we mean when we say digital geographies? Now, this is a term that has been used in various ways, but I think the best uh, definition as such has been created by Ash Kitchen and Lechinsky. Uh, the idea is to turn towards the digital as an object and subject within geography. Um, this understands that geographical scholarship has been impacted by the digital phenomenon, and we need to see how this is reshaping multiple geographies. And so there have been multiple instances of uh, the digitization of cities or smart cities that have been studied in Europe, that have been studied in Africa. Um, and similarly, I'm trying to apply that to the context of India. Uh, more importantly, it, al it allows us to look at the digital as a site of study. Um, and it therefore, and connecting that site to multiple modes of methods that we already have within geography and within geographical subdisciplines. And I'm going to show through my presentation how I am trying to unravel um, the structures and the processes and the institutions of smart cities through this sort of uh, digital framework, uh, digital geography framework, sorry. Okay, now this is a fair bit of a complicated slide, but what I'm trying to do is identify the policies, uh, the institutions and processes, uh, technocracy particularly, and new stakeholders. Uh, now for the smart cities mission, the data smart strategy can be considered as the main central policy. Uh, this is how uh, from the data smart strategy, most of what we are going to go through today has been defined. Now it does this particularly by creating uh, specific institutions and processes. Uh, three of the major institutions are the data maturity assessment framework, the smart city open data portal, and the India Urban Data Exchange. Uh, similarly, at the level of cities as well, you have certain institutions such as integrated command and control centers, engineering and technological departments that are a part of the uh, special purpose vehicle. Um, now, for each of these, there is a technocracy that is created. At the ministerial level, there is a mission data officer. Uh, the India Urban Data Exchange has CEO. Uh, cities have a great hierarchy of technocrats in the form of city data officers, data champions, data coordinators, and so on. These are only some of the technocrats that are, and some of the institutions, there are many more institutions as such. Uh, but as you can see that in comparison to conventional forms of governance structures, um, here you have this elaborate structure that is largely embedded within the idea of the digital uh, within and giving a strong focus uh, to data. Now, I'm calling them new stakeholders largely because the extent of the participation that private firms have been playing within this is quite wide. Um, now, there are, there are, these are just instances, the Tata Trusts, uh, PwC and Deloitte are some of them, but there are many others such as Amazon as well, um, who have been influential in setting up the Smart Cities mission and also been influential in shaping a lot of this substantially. So for instance, uh, Tata Trusts and PwC have been um, instrumental in uh, writing and creating, co-creating a big part of this data smart strategy. So the policy has been written out uh, quite extensively um, by uh, private firms. Similarly, the India Urban Data Exchange, uh, which is the portal uh, from which data is shared, is headed by CEO and a team of two, three others 
who are actually private persons um, who uh, have been appointed externally. So while the data maturity assessment framework becomes a part of um, government officers, the India Urban Data Exchange is being headed by private officers. Um, similarly, city data officers as well. Um, the first city data officer, in fact, uh, had been deputed uh, by the Tatas for the city of Pune. Uh, in the past few months, city data of around 100 city data officers have been appointed, and these also have been trained uh, by some of these private firms. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. What I'm going to do over the next four slides um, is I'm going to detail each of these out. So I'm going to give you uh, elaboration on the data smart strategy. I'm going to look at uh, the institutions and processes that have been created, what they set out to do, um, what are the specificities of technocracy and how this impacts the smart city mission, and a little bit of more focus on the private players as well. Um, so the data smart cities strategy, as it is called, is the dominant policy within the smart cities mission. Um, the, it aims, it suggests that it is uh, in for cities to create a strong data culture. Uh, this phrase data culture is used quite a bit uh, through multiple documentation of, um, uh, of data smart and others, um, but it's not really clearly defined. Um, and, but as you see, um, as we go along, you will see what, is, what are the various ways in which this, this term data cultures can be understood. Um, now, the primary goal of the data smart strategy is it's, it's a guiding document. It helps create cities create their own data policies. Um, when cities want to create tools or deploy sensors, uh, there is a specific guideline that the strategy lays out. Um, it's an important uh, document that facilitates data sharing between cities. It talks about establishing a data marketplace, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this idea of a marketplace later. Um, it gives guidelines on organizing hackathons, data events, uh, and it also gives you the standard operating procedures and methods of creating integrated command and control centers. Some of you may have heard this term uh, that multiple cities have established. These are, city, uh, these are centers uh, which are technology-based, which are aiming to connect different parts of the city, uh, collect data, share data, and I'll give examples of how this has been done um, a little bit later. Uh, now, there are three main institutions under the data smart strategy. Um, the data maturity assessment framework, the smart cities open data portal, and the India urban data exchange. Now, the data maturity assessment framework um, provides more of the technical guidance. So while the data smart strategy has a large um, framework for it, the data maturity assessment framework um, addresses the nitty gritties of implementation of technology. Um, it also gives out, uh, it also lays out um, procedures on how to classify data, how to organize data, how to collect data, how to store data, et cetera. Um, but what it also interestingly does is every couple of years, uh, it's, it's supposed to review um, the progress of the city in terms of the city's data culture and data maturity. Um, now, round one of the DMAF, the uh, assessment framework, has been implemented, uh, but the tools and methods of this implementation have not really clearly been defined. The second round is currently underway, uh, but from the last couple of times that I have been sort of trying to understand this, um, most cities have not really progressed quite uh, as much as was imagined by the data smart strategy. Uh, the smart cities open data portal is uh, an interesting portal and I strongly recommend all of you to take a look at it, um, where most of the data that cities generate is supposed to be stored and organized. Uh, again, this has not been as widely used, but there are some interesting data sets up there. Uh, now, similar to the data.gov.in platform, um, the Smart Cities Open Data Portal is also imagined as a portal where anyone, whether it is academics, whether it is citizens, but most importantly, administrators can access data, can upload data, can process data, uh, and exchange data as well. Um, now, the databases, right now, the databases are mostly sort of census records, crime records, weather records, and things like that. Uh, but this is imagined as a portal where large amounts of data will be dumped. Um, 
the last, uh, I mean, there are more institutions, but the third institution to focus on at this stage uh, is the inter-urban data exchange. Uh, the um, IUDX tries to do is, um, it says it's aimed at sharing data between departments, between cities, and with third parties. It also integrates the command and control centers uh, with the data, which is um, what it tries to do is, is it says that if you're going to be sharing data across all of these different departments, across different cities, there has to be a uniformity for it. So the IUDX sets up protocols, defines file types, um, and is aimed at sort of assisting an exchange of this data. Now, what is unclear at this point of time is how much of this data uh, which is going to be classified. So that's one thing that the data smart strategy does is it clearly defines what is open data, what is government data, what is private data, personal data, et cetera. Uh, but within the IUDX, uh, because it talks of this third party exchange and because it uses the vocabulary of um, data marketplace, it is still a little bit unclear as to what data is going to be shared with who and how much of this data is going to be anonymized how much of this data is going to be uh, personal, how much of this is going to be large aggregated metadata and things like that. And all of that has not yet been clearly defined even though the guidelines exist within policy. Um, now, moving on from the institutional structures to uh, technocracy, uh, now, it's historically been observed that existing bureaucracy uh, doesn't, may not have the technical knowledge. Um, it may not have the ability to implement technology or interpret data. An instance is, for example, during the pandemic, um, while a large amount of data was coming in, uh, traditional bureaucracies did not know how to handle geographical data, for instance, or how to use this in order to spot outbreaks and things like that. Now, this was done interestingly, for instance, by the cities of Surat or the cities of Pune, uh, where uh, data officers uh, who were trained in using GIS uh, managed to sort of create maps, managed to do targeted um, outreach uh, during the pandemic. Um, now, what the Smart Cities mission does, uh, especially within the Data Smart Strategy, is it creates uh, new technocratic institutions, new positions, and new processes. Uh, as I've already pointed out, some of these are private consultant technocrats, uh, while some of them are government. Uh, in fact, um, some of the um, city data officers, um, as mentioned before, are either as work as trained government officers, or they have been deputed uh, by the private firms as well to assist cities um, in order to implement the data smart strategy. Um, now, um, I'm going to talk now about private firms as stakeholders. Uh, on the left, this is just a cover of a report uh, by uh, the Tata Trust along with PwC. Uh, while on the right, there is a curriculum, which I will talk about. Uh, now, as mentioned before, uh, private stakeholders have been extremely uh, uh, extremely engaged in creating policy frameworks. Uh, now, this is also something I've been trying to understand, but I've still not managed to um, do this, is um, to what extent has the policy creation been done by, done by private firms? Uh, to what extent were other uh, participants engaged in creating all of these data policies. Um, private firms have also set up data institutions. Uh, for instance, um, a lot of the um, IUDX or the Smart City Open Data Portal, the actual platform um, is uh, created uh, by private firms. Um, it has appointed technocrats at various levels. It is training government te technocrats. And to some extent, it has a significant access to this data. Again, the extent of uh, how much it has access to um, is not really clear at this point of time. Um, just a, a brief on the image on the right-hand side is, uh, as you can probably see, um, it, it is doing a very active thing of combining uh, data with governance, uh, that it's it's not only looking at it from a purely technological point of view, uh, but from a bureaucratic point of view as well. Um, and, and it has multiple instances on how this sort of uh, uh, 
technological interventions can be used to improve education, solid waste management, uh, public health, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which has been laid out under the smart city guidelines. Uh, now this is just an illustration of how intensely um, visible private firms are in this entire process. Uh, on the left is an excerpt from the report that I just showed you the cover of. Uh, and on the right is um, uh, open data policy of Raipur Smart City. Um, and as you can see that, I mean, in, in this example that I'm showing, the table has been sort of photocopied and included in the open data policy, but a close scrutiny of the open data policy shows that vast, num um, a large amount of the actual policy has been taken uh, from the Tata PwC report. Now, this is ironic considering, you know, we talk of copyright, open data, um, and things like that. Uh, but this is just a sort of small funny example to show um, how, uh, how uh, private knowledge is making its way into official governmental policy. Um, now, this entire, um, this entire um, uh, datafication or uh, this entire, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, this intervention of technology within governance uh, has been called as datafication or has been termed as the algorithmic turn. Um, now, this, of course, is the creation of big data, implementations of tools by firms and government are all a part of this process. Um, however, there are certain things to look within it. Um, for instance, uh, there are instances where artificial intelligence uh, or algorithmic decision making has been implemented uh, in the cases of uh, certain smart cities. So as I was talking uh, before about uh, COVID, um, there were instances where uh, to map out possible outbreaks, uh, technology was used. Um, Kitchen and all refer to this sort of uh, process of the algorithmic turn as producing a new urban technocracy, which is equipped with expert knowledge. What this tries to suggest is conventionally where you would go to uh, um, government uh, governance, uh, sorry, conventionally where you would go to a bureaucrat or conventionally where you would go to a knowledge expert, um, you are now moving into uh, the domain of technology. So in to answer your questions of governance, you now have expert knowledge, which is largely uh, coming in through these technocrats. Uh, this also entails that there is a shift away from the government citizen relationship to government and corporations, because the best way to get this expert knowledge is from private corporations. Uh, this also suggests that uh, governance as we know it can become non-transparent uh, or what is termed as black box governance. To suggest that data, algorithms, code, etc., cetera, um, cannot be interpreted by the layman. Uh, that's one. So there's no way for you and me to sort of go through this entire data um, or understand the way in which this data has been evaluated. Um, second, that once technocracy comes in, um, this imposes its own governmentality when you're actually implementing it. Uh, lastly, this algorithmic turn comes with a concern of uh, targeting of neighborhoods or targeting of groups. Um, and in various instances in literature, it has been suggested that surveillance, disenfranchisement, discrimination is possible. And in instances uh, in the US as well, there have been case studies that have shown this. Um, there are multiple concerns that one can identify uh, apart from the ones that I just established. One of course is the larger uh, domain of privacy and surveillance. Um, uh, to what extent can this data be shared? To what extent is it shared with the government? To what extent is it anonymized? Um, is a big question that has not clearly been answered. Um, second is this entire uh, idea of algorithmic decision-making that at some instances uh, are government structures, governance structures making decisions or are these sort of technology dominated? And this can be a problem in the long run. Uh, third is the notion of data security. We, al we already have had uh, data leaks when it comes to Aadhaar. Um, what happens when we're looking at large big data gathering uh, at the city level? Uh, to what extent can we be sure that this data is secure, especially when a large percent of these portals are not under govern government scrutiny, uh, but are dominated by private firms. 
Um, now, this is also a comparison. Uh, this also uh, gives rise to another worry, which is the monetization of citizens' data. Uh, it has been suggested in other smart city instances, uh, such as Songdo in Korea, where uh, South Korea, where um, citizens' data from the city share with private firms to monetize. Um, and this goes hand in hand with uh, intervention in the financial structures of the smart city, where cities are supposed to become market dependent, cities, cities are supposed to create their own finances from private firms, and therefore this can be a bit of a, a worry. Um, next is this data, this algorithmic turn or datafication presence is um, prioritizing prioritizing the smart citizen. You're clearly suggesting that only citizens who have access to technology, only citizens who have uh, digital literacy uh, can somehow participate in these processes. Uh, conventional methods of uh, participation, those that are not able to access uh, web portals or social media uh, may be left out of it. And for apart from this sort of um, expert technocracy, there is also um, creation of an elite citizen uh, within the larger citizenry, which can be a problem in the case of India. Uh, lastly, uh, even though we have a personal data protection bill, which is undergoing um, changes and it has been criticized quite significantly, uh, most of the uh, smart city data policy is based upon the national data sharing and accessibility policy, which also has a lot of trouble considering um, there isn't enough accountability, there isn't enough scrutiny, um, there aren't enough checks and balances uh, when it comes to data sharing with governmental institutions. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about this notion of data justice. Um, uh, the term data justice has been created by Heeks and Shekhar, but there are multiple other variations of this that have been created. Um, the idea is straightforward, that citizens in developing societies should have justiciable control over their data. Um, and this control has to take multiple forms. So it has to be procedural, it has to be instrumental, it has to be rights-based, uh, it has to be structurally embedded, uh, and it has to uh, take distributive forms. Uh, this has been suggested in other ways as well. Um, so for instance, Litz points out that uh, digital uh, regimes should account for data inequalities. Now, this is something that the data smart strategy does not do. It simply considers uh, citizens as citizens. It does not take uh, into account any notion of data inequality. Um, uh, Kurma suggests that uh, digital regimes should pursue data openness. Now, this is something that data smart does, uh, but the way that the categorization has been done um, has multiple problems with it. Um, lastly, uh, that at the end of the day, um, uh, this datafication uh, should also allow for democratic action within it. So as uh, we are transforming either formally or informally, uh, conventional democratic action, conventional citizenship um, should find a way of negotiating with datafication um, and they should also become a part of uh, government, government policy. Um, now, this is where sort of I will move on into the second stage of my PhD research, where I'm, I, I intend to see that how does this happen on ground? And this is what I'm interested in largely is how does citizens participation through technology and data taking place? How are people, science groups sort of working together to create data or work with data? Um, what about open data groups such as GIS communities, mapping communities, um, um, creating data that is useful for uh, the citizens? Uh, and largely also what are offline engagements that exist? Um, there are multiple instances uh, of say, for example, mapping in the favelas of Brazil, um, or educational groups sharing information in the US where um, citizens groups have sort of turned, uh, uh, have utilized datafication for, uh, um, for things like education, health uh, and other concerns. Uh, and this is what I intend to do in the next phase uh, of my research um, during my PhD. Um, this is just a short bibliography of what I presented, thank you. Thank you very much, Harik. Uh, 
So uh, I don't think I said it and I don't think you wrote it, but Calic is with the Centre uh, de SESMA, Centre d'études sociales sur les mondes africains, américains et asiatiques. So, and with the IRD, uh, Institute for Sustainable uh, Development. So maybe, uh, so you come to France quite often, so maybe you could connect with people who are interested in this uh, research. So I suggest also you leave your email ID uh, because one of the goal of the uh, association is also to connect uh, people working on India. So that would be great is if after that you have new uh, uh, connections uh, potentially to work on, uh, on this uh, further. Uh, now I will leave the flow to uh, the audience uh, as I am sure there are uh, questions. Uh, so there is already a first one, which I'm going to read from uh, Gaurav, from the Center for Financial Accountability. Uh, I'm going to read the question, and maybe you can uh, answer it, uh, Karik. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the detailed presentation. Linking smart cities mission with, datafic with datafication, can you explain more about the sources of this data? How is it being collected? and what policies say about privacy issues. Also, in addition to this, who is controlling this data when control and command centers are operated by private companies? Okay. So that uh, is the first question you can answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, just a clarification, uh, the command and control centers are not operated by private companies. Okay, They are established uh, under the smart city special purpose vehicle. Um, uh, and as a unit, they have uh, data officers and uh, engineers and things like that who are appointed from the SPV and not by private firms. Uh, what private firms are doing is they're assisting them in setting up sens sensors, uh, setting up uh, um, data um, storage units, uh, data exchange. So they're acting more as facilitators as such. To answer your previous questions, um, there are multiple sources of data. Uh, one would be in the form of, um, for instance, um, apps that you use, okay? So cities that have um, instituted um, app-based delivery, uh, cities that have web portals where you can go and add on comments, uh, so, for example, in the entire metro process of the Pune Smart City uh, mission, there was uh, a very uh, detailed uh, way in which citizens could give their um, feedback upon the metro. Um, similarly, when the Smart City proposals were being developed, uh, citizens had participated using social media, using apps, using websites, and some of them actually had participated using paper and pen forms. Uh, but after the implementation of smart cities, um, the, what kind of data has is being collected is right now is a little unknown. So, for instance, um, we do know that cities have uh, uh, have CCTV cameras, okay, uh, which means and some of these integrated command and control connect CCTV cameras along with traffic networks along with uh, satellite networks. So some of this is collected from sensors, some of this is collected from cameras, some of this is collected from web portals uh, and things like that. Um, in terms of privacy, the, while I am a little critical of it, the data smart policy uh, is quite detailed in defining what are the various kinds of data. So it's, um, it's fairly straightforward when it says this is private data, this is personal data, this is government data, this is open data, and so on. Uh, the point is, while this exists in policy, when it comes to data sharing, we don't really know uh, how much of this data is shared, what are the re regulations behind this, uh, what are the standard operating protocols as such. Now, you know, I just showed that instance of a data report being used for a smart city open data um, policy. Now, if similarly, there are ways in which things have been copy pasted, who knows what part of, and I'm right now only three cities have open data policies. I'm trying to read uh, the other data uh, policies as well, um, but we don't really know um, what are the various regulations in place to avoid sharing of data, because right now the, uh, national data policy, uh, it's um, at a very low administrative level, you can get permission to access data. Um, so, of course, still we, uh, it's not very certain um, which data is being shared 
and things like that. I'm still working on that, uh, but it is an issue as such at this stage. Okay, thank you for this answer. There is another question uh, from uh, Vibhav uh, Raj, um, uh, which is related to the democratic uh, potential of the smart cities, the participative uh, democratic yeah. potential. Has any low literacy country been able to develop meaningful participatory mechanism for its citizens in rapidly digitizing governance systems? Any best practices that we could look into? So how to integrate uh, citizens who have uh, low uh, uh, literacy level, I think, is the question. And does it work? Yeah. Um, thanks, Verbo, for that question. Uh, now, one of course, is it's not only about low literacy and high literacy, but also what is considered as digital literacy. Um, there is the case of um, Karen Mossberger in the US who looks at uh, marginalized communities uh, to show that you may have existing literacy levels, but if you don't have access to digital literacy, if you don't have access to digital tools, uh, for instance, uh, you know, functional laptops with data connections or even cell phones with data connections, uh, then the literacy itself does not really um, matter much in that sense. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, the other is um, there have been, there are multiple instances of, uh, this is not to say that literacy is sort of a um, bottom line. Um, what we, after monetization, what we tried to do with the digitization of uh, cash transactions, for instance, was already done in multiple instances more than 10 years ago uh, in certain African countries on the um, East Coast, uh, where using SMS uh, networks, uh, the payment interface was created. This is long before 4G, long before 3G, you already had a, a digitized financial system that was created. Um, the, the third way of answering this question is looking at, and I've been looking at instances from South America, for instance, which they may not have um, low literacy, but um, marginalized communities or local neighborhoods have been working with citizens groups have been working with um, mapping groups, have been working even with Google and others uh, in order to create more information for its citizens. So for example, favelas, which are the informal set settlements uh, in Brazil, uh, which were historically, you could not find data on Google Maps or you could not find information on basic services within favelas um, have been digitized in the past three or four years uh, along with Google and along with a couple of others. Uh, there are, I mean, in the first world, of course, Amsterdam perhaps uh, has uh, the most detailed examples of, uh, but that's a completely different context and does not answer your question. Um, uh, but yeah, there are ways of looking at digitization. There are ways of looking at literacy and digital literacy in particular. Um, and yeah, there are multiple best practices, but um, right now I don't have them at hand. I'll definitely send you a few uh, instances of um, uh, good case studies of digitization. All right, thank you. Um, is there um, a question? Uh, is there anyone who wants to ask the question directly? Rishit, yeah, Rishit, you can uh, uh, you can open your mic. Hi, this is Rishit. Uh, I'm here speaking from India, and I I just wanted to uh, like sort of say that I am uh, understand like I wanted a little more kind of connection between dig the digital or the data world and the geography world, especially in the context of urban planning. That how does uh, like, you know, how, how does it actually translate on ground? This is something that I wanted, if you can, like even theoretically or conceptually, if you can point us out to something, some concepts. Um, uh, thanks, Rishit. Uh, um, it's not really my forte in sense of, uh, um, but um, um, I can't immediately think of how 
you you're talking in terms of sort of from a governance point of view infrastructural point of view could you elaborate a little bit yeah from infrastructural point of view uh yeah no, one is i mean one is you could, there are instances where this as i said before this idea of smart is not really defined um anywhere um and various cities have their own ideas of smartness um so for instance the there's this recent trend which looks at smart cities as being sustainable cities um but i i'm i'm, I'm sorry i'm unable to really because that's not my area um, so i can't really address this okay thank you yes um all right anyway kalik i think you'll have to uh, be uh, short because we have uh, 10 minutes left and okay. and there are probably uh, other questions coming so questions from uh, question from christine uh thank you kalik uh, it was extremely interesting uh, compliments uh, but now the question could you come back on the different uh, private firms involved that you have been studying so are there rather indian tech firms or transnational firms are they specializing in certain services for the smart cities um yeah these are mostly transnational firms uh, the only indian firm that has visibly been there is tata now remember this is also not the corporate wing of the tata this is tata trusts which is a um semi philanthropic part of the tata association or tata group um but of course the other organizations have spotted so far are price waterhouse coopers pwc um uh, deloitte is uh, quite centrally visible uh, now um to sort of connect this to um most of these firms and there have been others such as ibm and cisco uh, have been participating in smart city um formulations across the world over the past 2 3 decades uh in fact um, some of these um, firms such as cisco and ibm have slowly been withdrawing from certain cities uh, as well uh, such as the example i gave of songdo in south korea um, th there was a big sort of um, news about google withdrawing from the transformation of toronto as a smart city as well so there are multiple instances of um, while this has historically been the case of these transnational firms participating in creating these visions of smart cities um in many places around the world they are withdrawing now in the case of uh, india um just to answer quickly one is as i said that many of them have been instrumental in uh, policy uh, in the formulation of policy uh, many of them have been instrumental in the creation of city specific infrastructure uh, there have been um I'm sorry there have have been um these project management consultants who have been hired by certain cities um for specific projects um and i'm right now in the process of understanding to what extent are these tech firms uh, participating uh, but uh, using the tata trusts as an example they have been instrumental quite a bit at various levels uh, of this uh, process All right. Thank you. Um does anyone has uh, another question? No. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes, I'm Philippe Pumbert. I'm in Paris. And I've been in contact with uh, India Smart City Mission especially in uh, Amaravati and uh, Nagpur, Chandigarh. Uh, according to you what are the most advanced smart cities if I, if i can say so in the right city kind of race they were a, a long list of smart cities candidates and smart cities which have been uh, uh, selected by uh, government of india uh, what are the most uh, advanced smart cities uh thank you uh, for that question um i don't know how to define advanced at this point of time uh, but sort of using the um uh, uh, data maturity assessment framework um mm -hmm. most cities have not really shown the imagined transformation as such uh, amravati as you know was halted somewhere down the line uh, because of political or other reasons um but there have uh, 
in terms because i'm largely at this stage looking at this uh, digitization process um in terms of citizens participation using technology uh, cities in madhya pradesh uh, such as indore and bhopal have ranked the highest um mm. certain cities in andhra pradesh uh, and telangana have um, created technological frameworks have created uh, interesting um uh, infrastructure as such but at this stage what most people and i know other phd students who are studying smart cities as well uh, and th- uh, this is this is not like a detailed research answer uh, but most cities are unhappy with the progress as such like what was imagined in terms of technological implementation and uh, what has actually happened until now has not really met the baseline as such do you think that the momentum about smart cities in india has fallen because about 2 3 years ago smart cities was really the motto of the day you know, the government of india was talking every day about smart city mission and i think now it's a bit less um yeah i mean definitely and especially uh, most considering most of the uh, infrastructural implementation have slowed down uh, but at the same time um for instance the examples i gave of pune and surat and there are other instances as, as well uh, where cities have used technology quite extensively during the uh, health crisis and the sort of transition into uh using technology for very rapid uh, decision making or services deployment uh, is quite interesting to see and that's that's going to be the next phase of my research where i do want to see at the city level uh which cities have really managed to sort of incorporate this quite extensively but yeah i mean i would also agree with you that in terms of enthusiasm maybe it does seem a little lesser okay thank you yeah all right so we can maybe uh, incorporate uh eva mari yeah i think there is a problem with the yeah. connection of eva mari uh is there a last question so it's 2 pm already so maybe we can take one last question if there is any no questions in any case uh you have now the email contact of calix so you can uh get in touch thank you everybody and uh, see you for the next uh, uh webinar um for sure you will receive a reminder with the calendar so i hope that you will uh, join for the next one thank you very much calix very nice presentation thank you